Um, uh, and thank you for the organizer. Uh, uh, it is an honor to me to share uh, with you today as a moderator in this session. And uh, we're looking for all the time for the COVID times, the bad time. But I think the best, best thing came from this um, COVID time is uh, mega uh, online educational activity. Um, uh, without COVID, it will not come to the surface and to be more bigger every day like this. And all people from everywhere sharing the uh, uh, mega online activity. Uh, the second star for today, and it's very uh, uh, important top topics, uh, is Dr. Uh, Pedro Ariaja, MD. Uh, Dr. Ariaja uh, is a medical director of ICU at Memorial Hospital in Belize City in Belize. This is a very uh, small country beside Brasilia because uh, for me, I don't know this Belize except even just I go for a, a map and I read a lot about Belize. Uh, he's a director of point of care ultrasound unit at the same hospital. Uh, one word, a small word about Belize. Even Belize is a very small country, but it has a very big contribution worldwide. And also in mega online educational activity, you have many, many doctors from uh, Belize. And thank you for Belize, thank you for Belize doctor, whatever, whatever you are a speaker or attendee. Uh, the basic, basic training of our uh, speaker today in intensive care and internal medicine, we have a such topic, which is not only interesting, but uh, important, not just for anesthesia for all, the people work in COVID, and I think this in, in during the crisis, even the orthopedic was working uh, uh, in COVID uh, ICU. Um, so today is the ultrasound, and this is very interesting for me. I'm just waiting for a long time to, uh, to get this uh, uh, presentation. A long ultrasound in COVID patients. And the floor is for you, Dr. Ariaja. Is it okay? Yes. Yes, we can see now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, um, okay, uh, I have no any um, affiliation, any um, any conflict interest for this uh, topic, and the objective uh, today um, is to understand or recognize the ultrasound findings in the pleura and the lungs, to describe the standard. Hello, hello, your hello. your video, your own video, please, your own yep. video. Hold on a second. Yeah, I I send you to start your video. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Get it. Okay. Would you be kind to start from the beginning, please? Sure. So, to Thank start you. the objectives for the, this topic today is to understand and recognize the ultrasound findings in the pleura and the lungs. Uh, second one is to describe a, a centralized technique for ultrasound evaluation of the pleura and the lungs. To recognize and understand the uh, ultrasound findings in patients with pneumonia related to COVID 19. And to consider the creation of protocols to follow the progression with patients with pneumonia related to COVID 19. Generally speaking, you know there are two branches of clinical care ultrasound. On one side, the general critical care ultrasound uh, is dedicated to the evaluation of the pleura, the lung, the diaphragm, the abdominal ultrasound, and vascular ultrasound. And that will differentiate between, between you know, among procedure and diagnostic. On the other side, we call critical care ultrasound. The two of them that could be used, uh, you know, um, at the same time to give, let us uh, get the best alternative, you know, of uh, uh, information to treat our patients. Long ultrasound, you know, has several limitations. First of all, is that it's not anatomic; it's relying precisely in the um, presence of artifacts and uh, of normal type, of, you know, uh, images requires a competent operator for image acquisition and interpretation. The irrigated lung, you know, blocks the transmission of the ultrasound waves, make the situation a bit more difficult. And ultrasound is usually performed in supine patients. So it may be difficult to fully Im image the posterior thorax patients. And the other thing is, it's not specific. 
again, you know, we are accustomed to see these ultrasounds. We see the liver and kidney or see the echoes where you have the anatomical representation. And when you see the slide on the right side, you're wondering what, what is going on here. The most important thing, and one of the concepts that we're supposed to have in mind when we're dealing with machines, especially ultrasound, is that the machine has no brain. And it's the most important uh, um, person is the operator. So the operator has to have the skills to understand, to get the images and to describe them. And at the end, at the end of time, is to facilitate the process of, you know, um, um, get an explanation why those images are there. Um, this is a very important article, you know, uh, Alberto Goffey is uh, one of the attendants in St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. It's a, it's a hospital without a strain. And the complex of interaction of how we're supposed to be developing, you know, uh, the ultrasound process is like this. I means indication we need is the acquisition of the images, I the interpretation, and the last thing is medical decision making. Concerning the kind of transducers we're supposed to be using in a lone ultrasound, uh, the magic thing is that we could use the three of them. Uh, actually, we could add the macro convex too. But well, we know in general terms, you know that the higher the frequency of the transducer, the less the maturation of the same one, but the higher the resolution. For example, patients that have linear, just linear transducers, they have better resolution, but less penetration. Compared to curvilinear, they're usually used for abdominal ultrasound or the face ray or cardiac you know, transducers where the frequency is, is lower, but the penetration is better, but the lower resolution, the, the resolution is not gonna be as good. So in terms of how we're supposed to be scanning the chest, you know, should, there, there are different kinds of protocols, different kinds of ways. Uh, but in, term, in general terms, you know, we, you should scan the chest in at least A regions in a critical ill spine patient. That will include each hemithorax with a superior and inferior region anteriorly and laterally for a presumed diffuse process. And the thorax should also be scanned posteriorly for suspected regional processes or we end up comprehensive grant protocol to assess severity of the disease, especially in COVID-19 patients where we know that peripheral lesions are the most common ones and on dependent regions. So uh, Giovanni Walpicelli has been writing um, very much on, on, on lone ultrasound. And this is uh, the way we're supposed to be suggesting how to do the screen to our patients. Once again, you know, the lone ultrasound is, 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 is uh, special because the pulmonary parenchyma is not visible because air, air and bones, they are the number one enemies to ultrasound and there is terrible alternation with those kind of tissues. So lone evaluation is based on evaluation analysis of artifacts as we I mentioned before. So we analyze the, how is the pleural line, how thick is the pleural line, and if there is any evaluation, if, if any slide moving between the thoracic and the pleural, you know, visceral pleuras, the presence of A lines, presence of B lines, and the presence of consolidations of pleural efficiency, so the degree of pleural efficiency is supposed to be affecting patients. What are A lines? Or A lines, they are horizontal, regularly spaced, hyper ecogenic lines, uh, representing reverberations of pleural line. These are motionless and they are uh, artifacts of repetition. In two thirds of normal lungs, this is the only artifact pattern that we've seen. Which in some ways will bounce several times between strong reflectors before it turns to a transducer. And this is what is happening with the pleura because underneath the pleura, we have the lung tissue that's aerated most of the time. And then you have no, no I mean, tremendous amount of attenuation. This is what I said, these are classical air lines. They are equidistance, they're the same distance, they're from near. This is the subtissio from the pleural line, and then they have the same distance and repetitive. And what they're telling us is that there is air present. Daniel Lichtenstein is one of the uh, um, people that have been doing a uh, long sound for quite some time, and he described the bad sign that was supposed to be um, having an idea of the bad sign, taking concentration of the ribs here under the shadows. And, and the process of the, uh, the different kind of artifacts in the law. We're going back saying, you know, this is again, more examples of A lines, equidistance, they are repetitive, they are just reverberations, so they are ultrasound waves, A lines, A lines. 
What about bee lines? Well, bee lines they are vertical, narrow base lines arising from the pure line to the edge of the ultrasound. Common tail, tail image, you know, ultrasound long comments, you know, is a sonographic image only detectable on the base side with ultrasound probe position over the chest. This is defined as a hyper echogenic, coherent bundle with a narrow base and spreading from the transistor to the further border of the screen. And we have short, you know, common tail artifacts may exist in lower regions. Uh, they are also called by the fifth term common tail artifacts. When you have several B lines, the term we use is long rockets. This is uh, an image of a patient that had B lines in our hospital. This patient is a patient with congestive heart failure. You see the confluence B lines. And, and this is just to tell you that the amount of water in the, inter in, in the separation, the separate interstitial had been increasing dramatically. Well, again, what are the characteristics of the bill lines? They arise from a pure line, like this one. They are long vertical hypoechoic lines which continue to the depth of the image. They erase the, the, the A lines and they move the sliding block. More examples of what a long a, a B line is. Again, I know our patients here in the hospital, they have a congestive heart failure. You could see confluence B lines. When you got more than three or four B lines, they, they, with a diameter more than three or four millimeters, you say that's a positive finding. Think about the possibility, maybe an inter interstitial syndrome in your patient. So again, this is an extremely important concept that you're supposed to have in mind. Long ultrasound is non-specific. Maybe you could have the changes in the artifacts, but what you're supposed to be taking in consideration is not only what the ultrasound is telling you with artifacts and the images, but you're supposed to take in consideration with the, uh, the clinical uh, presentation of the patient, the um, clinical background and the history of the patient before. And also is in, in the case of uh, um, diseases, especially COVID-19, the positivity of the serological test. So B lines, they could be present in different kinds of conditions. So pneumonias and bacterial pneumonias and uh, ARDS, pleural contusion, lung edema, pulmonary fibrosis, post radiation changes. Again, just to go an idea, pleural line, pleural line, and bill lines. Those are evidence of the pleural line and abnormalities with some pleural consolidations patients compared to a normal pleural that is just to you have an idea of the difference. One more time, B lines. This, oh, sorry, this is the, um, the plura. We have the A lines. Uh, we have a B line here. Um, the amount of B lines is, is changing. And you see how the thickness of the plura is changing from a plura is supposed to be smooth and less than one millimeter to a plura is getting fractured with abnormalities, multiple B lines with spare areas. And that is the classical presentation in patient care by any more. One more time, this is the pleura again. This is the rib shadow, the rib shadow, those are A lines. The pleura, A lines, the shadow of the rib. And we have a, a, a normal pleura with a consolation, so pleura consolation with B lines here. One more time, this is the, uh, the consolidation with a fractured pleura, and they have. Um, uh, and abnormalities in there. This is a uh, A line with that consolidation, so pleural consolidation, and B lines here, so pleural consolidations, and the patient's supposed to have also a small pleural effusion. In some patients, you know, they have been described as something called the shred sign. It's a static sonography sign of certain long consolidation. The deeper the, bo the border of the consolidation, long tissue makes a contact with the irregular lung, is shred an irregular artifact that has a high sensitivity and specificity for pneumonias. One more time, you know, this is a subpleural consolidation, pleural line, the lines, normal pleural line. So, now, we talk about, we move from describing the pleura and the different kind of normalities you could find the thickness and the fracture pleura, also the slight movement in between the parietal and the visceral pleura. 
but also we start describing A lines and B lines, and then we move into consolidations. In consolidations, because of what's happening in the process of hepatization and pneumonic press in a pneumonia, pneumonia patient, what you have is a sol solidification of tissue that will make us think that this could be maybe a solid organ and not the lung. In this case, you see the presence of a bronchograms here, and you have uh, so, you know, so, uh, the presence of uh, um, pleural effusions, and uh, that makes you think the possibility of maybe uh, lower consolidation. Long consolidation games so, or uh, bronchograms, um, uh, long programs, people have dynamic and static bronchograms. And sometimes, you know, when you, you could, could make the difference because the classical patients who possibly have in uh, pneumonia, they have, you know, dynamic, uh, you know, uh, bronchograms when you could see the movement, you know, the, of the fluid in the bronchios compared, for example, patients that have maybe bronchiectasis where they are, air bronchograms tend to be um, static. Long consolidation again with our bronchograms in patients, lower pneumonias. And then when we start describing uh, patients supposed to be having um, um, clear effusions, you will find this is the diaphragm here, and we have uh, an echoic area of fluid with the um, partially collapsed lung. And, um, and this, what we, this slide moving, we call the jellyfish sign. And this present patient have pleural effusions. We have different kind of pleural effusions. We have, and the other thing we're supposed to be looking for is the present, for example, what we call the spine sign. Once you know you have water in the area where the pleura, the pleura is, there is better transmission of the waves, and you could be able to see the spine. Normally, the spine is not supposed to be seen, but up to the edge of the uh, liver after this because it's just air in a normal lung, you should be able to, you shouldn't be able to see that. Pleural effusion again, this is the diaphragm, pleural effusion and the lung with chronic bronchograms. So once uh, we uh, review uh, very quickly what are the findings and normal findings and artifacts in patients that have, you know, uh, or we do lung ultrasound, Let's concentrate on what is the clinical findings or the radiological findings or ultrasonographic findings in patients who have COVID-19. Thoracic ultrasound is an easy uh, to learn, dynamic and easy to repeat test. And you don't need advanced machinery or software, you know, so it's easy to repeat it. And if you need to change something, you need to recheck something, you could do it beside the patient. X-ray in patients with COVID-19, they are not as sensitive to identify normalities. And the abnormalities in, in the X-ray could be uh, absent more or less 40% of the cases. And we, we know sometimes in even that, we could make diagnosis, so make the changes in patients have maybe the clinical suspicion or have uh, maybe a, a viral pneumonia, let's say COVID-19, and, and then we could do some decisions based on the findings in the ultrasound. Long ultrasonography has been found to be useful to all to follow the progression of resolution of the disease because when, when we follow, oh, sorry. Once we follow uh, the long progression of the resolution of the disease because once the patient is getting better or the patient is getting worse, we could be able to do a precise recognition of the areas, different areas in the lung that are getting worse or getting better because we know how the artifacts are getting, you know, if the patient getting more B lines, if the patient have more consolidation, if the patient have more problems there, we know that probably the patient is getting worse. Compared to you have less B lines, less abnormalities in the, in the pleura, less pleural patients, and also the, the, the presence again of B A lines because this is telling us that the air in the lung is getting aerated again. Uh, what we know also is COVID-19 is a, is a bit of coronavirus, but it's highly contagious, extremely important to know and implement personal safety procedures before start examination. And the use of portal ultrasounds make the situation easier. And we don't need to transport our patients sometimes, you know, from the, um, the our ICUs into the CT areas to do um, CTs in our patients. 
certainly you know, the city continue being the gold standard for COVID, um, but you got to take consideration the, the fact that there is radiation, there's contamination, or high more chance of contamination, and the cost and availability, especially in some uh, countries where we have a lot of constrictions. Clinical experience has been shown that patients with the COVID-19 may have different kind of clinical presentations. They go from mild symptoms, fear and cough, to bilateral transition pneumonia. And in severe cases, you know, the infection moves so fast into acute respiratory stress syndrome with diffuse alveolar constellations. So again, what are the findings that we'll, we'll, we could be able to get in patients who have COVID-19 pneumonia? Going back to what we're saying for basic principles, there is a thickening irregularity of the pleural line. There is the presence of B lines with a variety of patterns that will be more focal, multifocal, or confluent. The presence of spared you know, areas or spaces in between the B lines is one of the classical presentations in patient have COVID. The presence of consolidations with multiple patterns you know, is one of the um, classical findings too. The small multifocal areas, usually subplural, Transloval consolidations, they could be there, but they, they are not as common as the, sub, uh, uh, the small uh, subplural ones with dynamic air bronchograms. Pleural effusions, they tend to be rare. Less than 15 to 20% of patients have large pleural effusions. And the, once the patient is getting better, you start seeing the, the long, the A lines because the lung getting irritated again. This is uh, one of the um, ultrasounds that we did in our COVID unit here in Belize. This was on one of the medical offices here. We just partial training. And the reason why I'm showing you is because the cover learning is very fast in ultrasound. Um, although, and you could see here is the fracture, you know, um, um, pleural line, I used to the B lines in this kind of patients and the spare areas is the, the rate. And all our patients here in the hospital, Fracture line, thick pleural line with multiple pleural, you know, B, uh, um, B lines in this kind of patient. The patient was an ARDS um, in a mechanical ventilator. Just to show again, so pleural consolidations, thick, thick pleural, you know, lines, and their bronchograms in a patient who have COVID 19. One more time, this is the pleura, this is the, the, the shadow. And this is a B line, the pleura, we have subpleural consolidations, shadows of the ribs, pleura here, shadows, B lines. This is a subpleural consolidation, look like a bite type of sign. B lines, the pleura thick with B lines and air bronchograms, pleura, air, rib shadows, B lines. Abnormal pleura again, fracture pleura with so use so of pleural consolidations. The pleura is thick, consolidation here, the lines and the rib gel. So pleural consolidations, rib shadows, B lines, pleura. Pleura, B lines. Once again, so pleural consolidations and constellations for air bronchograms in a B-line patient. More subpleural constellations in a thick pleural line with confluent B-lines, we call it wide long patient the heart. So if we, we know that we have, we have different kind of artifacts and we need to analyze these artifacts in the context of anatomical you know, uh, images too, and the patient have um, um, respiratory symptoms and we use in long ultrasound. So because of the findings we have, uh, they have several you know, people that have been trying to propose international standardizations of use of long term for patients COVID-19. This is one of them, we classify in four stages. This is the clinical findings in the patient. Uh, and this is what we found uh, in the ultrasound findings. So in the stage one, patient had no complications, you should have a lines. Patient pneumonia with no signs of pneumonia, focal B lines, uh, patient is getting more affected with affection of their respiratory rate and uh, the saturation. He got diffuse and multi lower B lines. And you could start seeing subpleural consolidations, 
two more advanced conditions where the patient had a diffusion with the focal bead lines, long, long constellations and a while long pattern. Um, again, you know, what Pichelec like, has been writing quite some time, this is an article from, um, from uh, um, intensive care where they are trying to, do, this is from the International Multicenter Study uh, in May, that was done in, in European and American countries, American ICUs. And what they're trying to do is trying to correlate the clinical presentation and, uh, and how the ultrasound performs. And what is the possibility that we could correlate the clinical evolution with a patient ultrasound? There were almost 1,500 patients in 20 centers. And, uh, and as you see, they analyze the person multiple B lines. There are no B lines. Rest of the chest is normal. The possibility I have a long ultrasound and um, probably not going to be suggestive of, of COVID pneumonia. Patients have no multiple lines, but consolidations are large in FR fission that the classical presentation of bacterial pneumonias. So I'll give you one an idea. And then you're supposed to be thinking maybe from an alternate type of you know, uh, uh, diagnosis based on the imaging and the long ultrasound. If the patient has multiple pain lines and they are separated with a homogeneous distribution, you're supposed to be thinking about maybe the, an alternative type of, you know, um, the uh, type of, and, um, of diagnosis, depending on who the patient is, depending on the background of the patient, if the patient has maybe uh, pulmonary embolism or they have some other things, and if the person is bilateral or, or unilateral, classically, the pneumonia is a patient have, you know, COVID-19, they are bilateral, bilateral, bilateral and they have peripheral, you know, affection most of the time, and then they're getting more coalescent. If the patient have a coalescent light beam and spare areas of the classical presentation is bilateral multifocal, there's probably high possibility of maybe uh, um, ultrasound suggested of COVID-19. Um, so any the patient have pleurogularities, small peripheral constellations, and they are not present, but the patient have bilateral bead lines, maybe it's an intermediate long ultrasound, and you should be taking consideration your clinical um, presentation at the background. So again, they created this, is uh, a formal algorithm where you're supposed to be taking consideration not only uh, the clinical science of the patient, but also the um, the presentation of different kind of artifacts and images in ultrasound to take a decision of where you're standing, or what are the probabilities to have, more chance to have maybe COVID-19. Again, if you compare, for example, in ultrasound, so again, you need to look for the lowest or so the higher probability based on the clinical context, the serological determination, and the background of the patient. Compare, for example, patients that have CTs that you'll turn to be negative or positive. This is an X-ray article that uh, is a long ultrasound score to monitor COVID-19 patients, progression and patient with RDS. So basically what it's supposed to be is, is you need to be systemical, you need to have the experience, you need to do repetitive ultrasounds and be sure that you have a precise way to describe the findings and understand what is happening with the patient to decide what can be the best way and the best decision to do with your patient in front of you. So one of the points to take is this, is the long ultrasound is a, is a tool that has been shown to be easy to learn, supportable, can be used at bedside, scape of excellent image quality, has a low cost, we're not exposed to radiation to our patients, and is reproducible in the context of patient respiratory conditions. Not only that, but also you could add, add to this that with ultrasound, a bit focus ultrasound, you could be able to act, you know, get echocardiography that could help you also to decide in some patients, what is the best decision to make for them? Non ultrasound complements clinical variation and somewhat forms radiological aids. A non ultrasound is an operator dependent. So, therefore, training and, and establishing all universal protocols is important for reproducibility and dependability. Non ultrasound is not specific. And this is again to, re, to the, the importance of this is it's not specific. You have to have your skills, you have to have the clinical background. You have to get information for a patient and you decide what's going to be the best way to go. So its value will depend also on the physical evaluation and the present laboratories. I think it's the last one. And this is just to show this or a photograph for me coming out of the, of the hospital one, two or three o'clock in the morning after seeing a patient there. So thank you for your uh, time and, and uh, you have any questions? Um.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pedro, for the interesting lecture. And uh, you show in your presentation is very good because when I started ultrasound, I was um, um, teached by uh, my senior that this is a vein, this is an artery, this is the lung. And I look at him, I see that this is a crazy man. I don't see anything. This is like a gray and white and black stuff. But you know, you breathe in the uh, training and how to use optimally use your machine. And it's very important. And you must know the normal to know the abnormal. And also the machine is not, uh, don't have a brain. So uh, your brain can't see what's, uh, your eyes can't see what your brain no, don't see. So it need a, a very good uh, long time training and uh, uh, with professionality and the increasing in the uh, training scale, you can just get a uh, good information from ultrasound, which invade our life in everything, not just for ICU, for pain, for regional anesthesia, for obstetric, for echo, for everything. So, um, uh, you know that uh, I, I have uh, two questions until uh, uh, if, if you uh, have any question for the, Dr. Bedro, you can put it in the question and um, answer button, but I have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, first question, this, is that data came from ultrasound, is comparable to the data came from CT for a patient in, in, in COVID disease or not? Well, the, it depends on the background of the patient. Again, you know, the information you get from ultrasound is important. Once you have the context of the clinical background patient and the clinical presentation, it's getting more complicated. You have a patient, for example, you have, you know, any other underlying conditions. If the patient had been having radiation before, or the patient had maybe a uh, um, can I say maybe has COPD or the yeah. patient has some more contest. If the patient have maybe a, um, 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 whatever is supposed to be underlying patient, it's extremely important to decide where they work. So ultrasound mm -hmm. is again is based on probabilities. It's not that it's not that diagnostic, a diagnostic tool that tells negative or positive. And you could do some correlations with the CT, but the most important thing is you need to keep the context in probabilities, not based on negativity and positivity. Yeah. Uh, second question, um, really, because I'm just, um, I don't work for ICU a long time until this COVID crisis. So, um, uh, do you think in the future, the ultrasound will give you uh, more and more data with training, with the innovation and the technology uh, to give you a diagnosis over other diagnosis? Because you know that you speak about the, all what you found in the lung, it can be any disease, it can be many diseases. So do you think in the future with the improvement of the technology and the training care for us, uh, because uh, COVID is a very short time now in, in comparison to the age of uh, science, uh, it will be something to, to put a diagnosis over a diagnosis? Do you think that? Well, I think, you know, again, ultrasound is a tool for us to decide. And, you know, the good thing in patient and people that we do uh, critical care is that uh, we take the decision in front of patients compared to some more type of noise specialities where they take decision based on just images. We complement the images with the clinical background and the pathophysiological process the patient have underlying there. So I believe, you know, if you take in consideration that, for example, the um, applications of ultrasound could be enormous. For example, patient has sepsis, that we could see that the, the, we could use echocardiography also to see how the heart is improving in patient with sepsis, or the patient have pulmonary embolism associated to the condition you have or for just fluid management in patients we have in ICU. For us to have complementary, you know, the, um, tests to do Doppler ultrasound in a patient have pulmonary embolism. Even for uh, patients supposed to be having a special, you know, vascular access, it's, it's important to use ultrasound. So ultrasound is a very, very important tool for us to use as a complementary to what we do with a patient from a clinical point of view and from the lab point of view. Yeah. Uh, this last question, because we don't have a big room for uh, more questions, uh, is uh, from Dr. Mohammed Suleiman, our colleague in Qatar. He asked a question, I don't know if it's related to the lecture or not, but I will uh, read it for you. Uh, do, do, do you plan to make an, uh, with your team uh, an atlas for ultrasound, uh, uh, what's called lung ultrasound for COVID disease or something like this? Hey, open so eye. Oh, no. <laughs> well, but you see, one of the things that we try to do right now in, in my hospital is that we try to create a website in such a way that could be able to do our experience with COVID-19, experience some other type of, you know, uh, pathologies using ultrasound. Um, probably in the next maybe a couple of weeks, we could have the website on. And what we're going to do is I will start doing our own lectures and presenting, you know, our experience and beliefs. 
in such a way that could be able to share, you know, international with you guys and some more people and try to get more, more knowledge and skills uh, to take care of our patients in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. And um, uh, nice to be with you in uh, this meeting. And uh, 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 because the time is uh, squeezing us, we just will go for... Uh, 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 and thank you for please also. Thank you. Uh, thank you.